anybody can fail for a short period of time. Anybody can work hard for a short period of time. Anybody can put effort into something for a short period of time, but only the mentally tough uh, human beings, those who have grit can do it day after day over a long period of time, not knowing when the sun will come up, but knowing that if they just never give up, it will happen to them. Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Academy podcast, the podcast dedicated to simplifying the commercial real estate industry for the masses. Each week, we sit down with industry experts to dissect the many facets of commercial real estate and extract valuable lessons you can apply to your business. Whether you're a new or seasoned business owner or investor, the Commercial Real Estate Academy podcast will be your go-to resource for all your commercial real estate needs. Now, here are your hosts, Rafael Collazo and Jeff Walston. Welcome to the Commercial Real Estate Academy podcast. I'm your host, Rafael Collazo, here with my co-host, Jeff Walston. How's it going, my friend? Um, can't complain. If I did, I don't think anyone would worry about it or care. So I'm going to keep trucking along with my uh, trials and tribulations of this year. But no, the outlook's looking good for 2023. I'm grateful for everything that's going on. But uh, what about you, Raphael? How's it going? Good, good. You got a, you got a, several big projects you're closing up too, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, the, the leasing yeah. side is very active right now. The buy side is slowed down a bit, but it's still very active. There's still a lot of money out there uh, chasing good investment opportunities. And, you know, we, we probably have one of the, the top people in the world regarding, you know, investment real estate. Um, his brokerage has grown rapidly over the last seven or eight years since his inception. Uh, back in, I believe in 2015 or 2016, Kyle Matthews, the CEO of Matthews uh, Real Estate Investment Group. Welcome, man. It's great. It's an honor to, to, to have a conversation with you. I appreciate you guys having me on. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. So what we typically like to do when we first interview our guests is to learn a little bit more about them. So if you don't mind kind of sharing a little bit about your backstory, I think that'd be awesome. Um, Yeah, no problem. Where do you want me to begin? Like, Beginning. I, how, yeah, of course. How, I think, well, I think how I got the, into the industry. Yeah. Well, that, that could transition into that. I think getting a perspective on the person helps a lot because, you know, I think part of our evolution as people starts from the beginning. So if you could share that, I think that'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, I, uh, gosh, where do I begin? So born in California, 1982. So I'm a, I'm a nice round 40 years old. Um, oh. but, uh, I, um, uh, Come from a big family. You have five, uh, four siblings, so five total, including myself, an older sister, three younger brothers, uh, mom and dad together. Uh, shout out to Big Clay and Leslie. Um, you know, I grew up. I actually, I'll give you something interesting off the bat. I moved uh, about twenty five times as a kid, um, oftentimes back and forth to locations I had previously lived in. The reason for that is uh, my dad played in the NFL, so he was a he was a linebacker. Um, in the National Football League for 19 years. Um, I, I believe he holds the record for most games ever played at that position. So, you know, he's a he's a he's a tough man in that sense. Um, most of his career was spent with the Cleveland Browns. So the way it would work would um during the season, I would live in Cleveland from August to effectively like the end of December, right? And I would do the first semester um you know, kindergarten, grade school, and then all, to, all, all the way to junior high in Cleveland, Ohio. And then after the last game, after the last regular season game, we would move out to Los Angeles, which is where my mom was from. And um, they had met at USC. Uh, and uh, we live in Los Angeles uh, for the for the spring semester and, and the summer. So I did that um, all the way till I was about 16 years old. My dad played, um, yeah, I think I was a sophomore in high school, if, if I'm not mistaken, he finished his career with the Atlanta Falcons, most of the time with the Browns and then the last three years, at Atlanta Falcons. So grew up in Strongsville, Ohio. And then when I was about 13, you know, when the season came around, we moved to a, a little town outside of Atlanta, Lowburn, Georgia. And I went to um, middle school and then Parkview high school out there. And then when I was a sophomore in high school, my dad retired, we moved out to Los Angeles full-time and finished up high school there. And then ended up having the the privilege of, of, of going and playing football at USC out in Los Angeles for the Trojans. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of the childhood in, um, three minutes or less. So obviously there's a lot more to it, but, uh, that ultimately put me in a position where right after school, 
coming out of SC, I got straight into real estate brokerage and ultimately started my career in commercial real estate. That's awesome. Well, and I think the 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 context there is great because it, it kind of gives us an understanding of you as an individual. Because I'm assuming moving back and forth and transitioning, it, it takes a lot of adaptability, especially yeah. as you're a, a child, because you know you have your friends or whatever else. And if you're constantly moving around and, and engaging with different people, you know you build that that fortitude when it comes to that sort of thing. So yeah, and you, you know, obviously, as you can imagine, we've talked about this a lot within our family about the uniqueness of of that experience that I just kind of walked you through having a, a dad who played, you know, high profile guy in the NFL, as well as moving back and forth so many times. And um, it's my opinion. I think most people in my family agree there's more benefits than drawbacks there. Uh, certainly it can be hard moving that much. It can, it can be disruptive uh, just from a schooling perspective. Cause um, you know, I always joke, there's certain subjects that I don't think I was ever taught like long division. Um, I think they taught it in the fall in California in the spring in the South. So like I just missed it. And so uh, my son who's 12 now the other day brought over the long division with the check mark. I was like, dude, I can't help you, man. <laughs> but uh, you know, just a, a little funny nuance of, 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 of moving that many times, but I, I loved it. I loved seeing my friends every six months. Like it was, you know, it was like, you got all the benefits of being the new kid, which is there's excitement, but none of the drawbacks. Cause I was usually going back and forth to the same school. And you know, the drawback is like, literally when you're the new kid, you don't know anybody. I generally knew, you know, people at the school I was attending. So, um, I, I loved, you know, getting to experience different things. It, it ultimately as an adult, um, I moved out of California about four years ago, made that transition for myself, at least very easy. Cause it wasn't unfamiliar not to live in California, though I had lived there for a long time. Um, and yeah, to your, to your point, like even when you know people, it, it builds resiliency, adaptability, you must develop the ability to um, connect with people, find commonality. And, and ultimately it, in many ways, especially as a kid, get them to like you. Cause that's important, you know, especially as a kid, I'd, I'd, I'd argue to some degree that never goes away, but really as a, as an elementary middle school, high school, it, it's so important, you know, for everybody guy or gal to be liked and to fit in and to have a, a social network. And um, when you're moving back and forth, you definitely, uh, in my opinion, you're put in a position where you're forced to develop those skills if you don't inherently have them. And so all of those things, all of those um, talents, skills, whatever you want to call it, unbeknownst to me, it was in many ways, you know, good practice for the career. I eventually chose commercial real estate brokerage where it's, it's you know, there's so much of about it. So much about it is about relationships and getting people to like working with you and like doing business with you. Um, the foundation of which has to be based on your ability to execute the assignment, but just getting them to a place of, of giving you up the, awarding you the opportunity to go to work from many times can become a personality contest. So uh, yeah, you're, you're hundred percent right. That unique childhood definitely, um, in my opinion, put me in a position, uh, put, gave, gave me an advantage when I, when I chose this, this, this career. Definitely. Was there a certain uh, aspect to commercial real estate that drew you to that instead of going into any other type of investments or any of that? Or Yeah, you know, I uh, one of the things about playing football at SC, especially at that time with, you know, Pete Carroll and those guys, Reggie and, and, and you know, the talent I was fortunate to play with is very quickly, I recognized I probably would need to find something else to do with my life. You know, it's a you may, you know, if, if you find yourself thinking you're a good player and I was a safety. So, um, it, you know, all of a sudden you, at USC, you, you go there to play safety and there's a guy who plays your position named Troy Polamalu. And you're like, uh, crap, man, I'm probably not going to play very much. Um, you know, the downside is you don't play that much. You don't, you know, you, you get, you go into there with these, um, big yeah. dreams, but the, the upside of that, um, outside of just playing with great players, winning lots of games. We won national championships when I was there was um, it kind of gives you an early start to pivoting. And uh, so many of my teammates struggled with that, still struggle with that 20 years later, still struggling to move on from football. And, and that's a, that's another conversation for a longer day of, you know, what happens when what you do becomes who you are and then you can't do it anymore. It's really difficult for them. And, um, and I, and I, I recognize that and I, I, I sympathize with that, but for me, it wasn't that difficult because basically the first day I was down there, I, you know, again, I saw a guy like Troy and I was like, okay, well, uh, you know, this might not work out for me. I better find something else to do with my life. And so to your, to your question, um, 
I, I always wanted to get into commercial real estate, didn't know much about it. And, and the reason for that, and this is, this is where my answer comes in. My dad owned one building, okay. Um, an apartment building in the San Fernando Valley, not, not too far from where we lived in, uh, in California. He actually had purchased it from my grandfather who had built it and he was going to sell it. Um, his father-in-law. So my mom's dad was going to sell it. And my dad's like, well, I guess I'll buy it from you, you know, kind of all shucks. And he bought it. And I was the oldest, I was the oldest boy, which means I got the, I got the bad jobs around the house. So like, you know, Saturday morning, my dad needed to go to the apartment building to meet with the onsite or, you know, maybe there's a roofing issue or something like I was the one who got to keep him company. And, you know, at the time I didn't, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to go outside, skateboard, play basketball, whatever it was, go to the beach, but that wasn't how it works. So I went with my dad to this building and multiple times. And, and, um, I remember one time and I'm going to kind of generalize what happened, but I remember the feeling was, you know, I was like, dad, so what, you know, what is this building? And he's like, it's apartment building. Okay. And what, who are all these people? Well, there are units here and there are people who live in the units. And okay. I, you know, I'm probably 12 years old. I understand that. But then, you know, at some point he explained that every month they pay rent and they pay him rent. I was like, so wait a minute, they, they live here. You own the building and every month they have to pay you money. It's like, yeah. You know, he didn't walk me through like the concept of passive income at the time, but it was the first time it dawned on me that if you could just figure out a way to come to own one of these assets, people have to pay you forever. Right. It's a lot more complicated than that. It's a lot more expensive than that. There's certainly a lot of risk. But as you know, a 12 year old kid, I'm like, whoa, that's amazing. Like, I want to do that for a living. I want to be paid rent by other people. And um, again, so much more goes into putting yourself in a position to do that. But that was when I said, oh, this commercial real estate thing, I don't know what it is, but I want to do it. And I, I always had that in the back of my head. Um, again, you know, football. Uh, was was my main occupation in uh, in college in terms of focus, physically, mentally, emotionally. But as soon as I realized that that I was going to enjoy every second of it, but that was going to wind down, I started to look more seriously at real estate. Um, and ultimately, uh, that I'm going to continue with the answer that led to me connecting with uh, an alumni who's in the real estate um, business on the investment side had just, you know, sat down and grabbed coffee with him and said, you know, I'd love to get into the business. And he said, uh, you know, do you, do you have any experience in real estate? I said, not really. You know, okay. You know, do you have any money? I said, I don't have any money. He goes, do you know anything about investments? I go, no. And he goes, well, you should be a broker. And I go, oh, okay. Like, and he didn't mean that in the sense like brokers don't know anything and, you know, they have no experience. He meant it like it will provide you a tremendous amount of opportunities to evaluate deal flow. So you very quickly will start to understand what's a good deal, what's a bad deal, you know, and uh, much more so than even maybe going to work for a developer and they might look at 10 or 15 projects a year. As an agent, you're looking at, I mean, if you, even if you're pitching a hundred deals a year, you're diving into hundred assets, but when deals are hitting the market, you're looking at 10, 15 deals a day. Um, secondly, he said, look, it's very difficult. I've never done it. I know it's very difficult. Those first couple of years are tough and you don't make much if any money, but if you can make it through that, you could, you could do quite well for yourself. And so, you know, I'm sitting there like, okay, I could understand investments better. I could possibly make a lot of money. And, um, I said, this sounds like, this sounds like a, a great opportunity for, for me and what I'm looking to do. And, uh, this guy was kind enough to introduce me to some top agents at some firms. And my dad, uh, who I love very much said, you need to take the first job offer to you. Like, you know, you don't get to sit around waiting for the perfect, uh, you know, this, this was a, I guess now that I'm 40, I get to say this is old school, right? Like I'm, you know, back in the day guy. Um, so yeah, I just um, interviewed at, you know, CB Cushman, uh, Marcus and Millichap. And the first person who called me back was a, uh, Jonathan Weiss at Marcus and Millichap and, you know, 10 seconds in, I said, I, I'm in, didn't even ask how much I get paid. Cause it turns out I don't get paid anything, but, uh, didn't, you know, I just said, done, sign me up. I'll, I'll see you Monday. So that, that's how, that's how I got interested and in ultimately into, into the business. That's awesome. No, I mean, and, and I feel like, you know, obviously building connections within the commercial real estate business is how you ultimately get into the business. I mean, I, I didn't come from a real estate background either. And it just so happened through a networking opportunity and meeting several people 
got an opportunity to interview with a, a brokers that I ultimately paired with and mm-hmm. it was off the races. But, you know, I feel like unlike residential real estate where anyone just, you, you can kind yeah. of hang your hat wherever you want. It is much more of a, you know, relationship business in the commercial real estate space. So it's kind of interesting to hear your take on that. One yeah, thing I, I'm, go ahead. I'm just, go ahead, Kyle, go ahead. I was no, going to say, I, I had, I had uh, through a family friend access to residential um, brokerage it just um, and having spent some time at that office and, and just understanding the business, it got me halfway where I wanted to be, which was you know, in commer- in, in real estate transacting. But it just on the residential side, just for me and how I was built, it, it was too much emotion. You know, it was mm-hmm. somebody. It could be the perfect house with the perfect square footage in the yard and in, in the right school district, and it's like, well, I don't, you know, I don't like the color of the paint. You're like. Yeah, but we could change the pain. That's like, nah, it's just the feng shui. And I didn't, I, I wanted to be just the way I was wired. I just wanted it much more to be a pragmatic, like, okay, what are the yields? What are the returns? You know, are you cash on cash buyer? Are you IRR buyer? Whatever you're, wh- whoever you are, assuming I could ask the right questions to where a, a potential investor would communicate what it is they're looking for, that if I found an asset that fit that, there was a very high probability that a deal could get done. And I liked, I like to, not that there's any certainty in commercial real estate brokerage, but I like the certainty of that versus the residential side, which was much more feelings based and uh, could potentially change, you know, minute by minute. For sure. No, I couldn't agree more. So one of the things you kind of alluded to early on in the conversation was, you know, the early struggles of brokerage. You know, I'm sure you're well versed in that. One thing I'm kind of curious about when you first started, what what were some of the early struggles you faced? And then kind of a second part to that question is what do you think makes an excellent commercial real estate agent or broker? Yeah, you know, mental toughness, candidly. Um, and I'll get to that. So early on, tremendous struggle, you know, whatever, however you could lay out the worst start to brokerage, that was what I experienced. So, you know, in kind of no particular order, I didn't close a deal for 17 months. And um, and that was a very hard, uh, you know, physically hard, but like really immensely and emotionally, you know, in many cases kind of demoralizing it. um, I didn't know anything about commercial risk. I didn't know how to underwrite assets. I didn't know... I didn't know how to ask the right questions, even understand what was important to potential investors. I didn't understand the relationships between current rents and market rents. I just didn't know anything. Again, in in college, you know, for right or for wrong, I was very focused on athletics. It was very important to me. I had a phenomenal experience. I wasn't one of those college kids that was taking real estate finance classes and then going and interning at like the developer's office down the road. And so I just came in very unskilled and, 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 I lacked general knowledge. And so the first 17 months, it was really, that was my education. And, um, and so what made it harder was I was working harder than any human being at the company I was at, like anyone that I could not only see, but even remotely connect with once it kind of came out in the conversation, I get, so I got in the office every day at five 45 and I'd stay till eight 30 at nine every day, Monday through Friday, and then I was also in the office Saturday for usually seven to eight hours. So I'm not saying I'm the only person who's ever worked those hours. I doubt that. I think there's people who probably work longer than that, but that was, that was it. I remember my first week at the office, I, I went in and, you know, I, uh, I knew I didn't know much about real estate, but I was like, no one's going to outwork me. And I went to my manager's office and said, Hey, you know, who's the first guy in? And, you know, he pointed oh, that guy over there. Okay. What time does he get in? And usually six 15 in the morning. I said, okay, I'm gonna beat that guy in. And I said, who stays the latest? He's like, oh, it's, it's, it, you know, it's that guy over there. And what time did you say? Like eight, eight, 15, eight 30. He's like, okay, I'm going to stay later than that guy. So I said, you know, I'm kind of like simple minded in that. Okay. I know. I don't know that much about real estate. I, I, I feel like I have some degree of intelligence, you know, that's, that's up for debate. I'd let others decide, but I can control work ethic and I can outwork anybody. And so ultimately it was me saying, look, if I just come in before everyone and I stay after everyone and I just kind of do what I'm trained to do, I got to think I'm going to be successful. Right. And and I got to think like, I'll make it now. Am I going to make millions and millions of dollars and be the number one agent? Like I hoped so, but I felt like I knew that that was hope. It was like, well, I hope I get there. But what I knew is that if I just am the first one in and the last one out and I just, and I'm coachable. And I just can apply what I'm being coached. Like, I'll make it. Like, I don't know. That was just how like my monkey brain thought. It was like, I just pretty simple minded guy. And um, 
well, I was right and I was wrong. I was wrong in that. It, it took longer than anyone, but I was right that eventually I did make it. It just, that first, you know, year and a half was so difficult, not just because I was working long hours and, you know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't taking care of myself in terms of, I was like eating crappy food. I didn't know what I do now about health and nutrition and diet. Again, this is, again, this is how you get old. It's like, well, back when I was your age, like we didn't talk about the food we ate. It's like, well, yeah, I could have done myself better favors, not crush, you know, 1500 calorie, you know, Chinese food lunches and then put myself basically into a coma from two to four. But, <laughs> but, you know, I pushed through that and, um, and, and it was just, what was really hard was seeing other guys and gals who came out of training right before me, same time, even after closed deals before me. Um, and, but I was working so much harder than they were. And that was, it felt, um, I'm not, I've never had victim mentality. I'm not a victim. I have an agency over my life. Um, I don't want to say it was unequitable. It just felt confused. It was confusing. It was like, wait a minute. I'm making 500 cold calls or more religiously every week, talking to 80 to 120 people a week. I'm going on five to six meetings a week. I'm presenting two proposals a week. I am doing it exactly how they taught me, but to like to a magnitude more than anyone else. Like I am doing more than anyone else. I meet these people. They're not, I don't think they're smarter than me. I'm not saying I'm smarter than them, but they're not smarter than me. Um, maybe they know a little bit more about like, what is happening? This is so frustrating, but I just, um, I was never going to quit. I've never quit anything in my life. I wasn't allowed to quit as a kid. And that just became my DNA. And so I say, I can't quit. I don't care if it takes me 20 years. Like they're going to have to like forcibly remove me from this office before I quit this. Like I will never accept failure. I'm not a failure. And so I'm failing, but there's a difference between failing and being a failure. Failure is accepting it. Failing is just, you fell short of what your goal was. And so, um, that first year and a half was brutal. I was working, you know, whatever that is, 80, 90 hours a week. I was putting on weight, wasn't working out. You know, I was, uh, my wife at the time I was dating, I didn't see her very often. So I wasn't the most, uh, you know, connected uh, boyfriend in the world. Uh, you know, you miss the family dinners on Saturday night. You know, it just, it was just, um, you know, in the, in the moment, it's like a dark period of your life where you're like, oh my God, this is so hard. But then like anything that's really hard, you look back, it's like absence makes the heart grow fun. And I'm like, man, those were the good old days. Like, well, it certainly didn't feel like it when I was in them, mm -hmm. but yeah. you know, but now I look back and I, I literally, whenever I allow myself to think back in that period of my life, the first year or two were so hard. Like I, I literally can't stop smiling because I know that it was those struggles I was going through. It was those trials and tribulations. It was the growth, both personally and professionally, the skill sets I was developing, um, maybe not as fast as I wanted, but I was developing skills, the client relationships I was beginning, I was planting a seed. It hadn't grown yet, but like I was putting seeds in the ground metaphorically. Like mm -hmm. that was what ultimately allowed me to, to do what I did professionally. You know, it just, I didn't know it at the time. And so you just got to have the mental discipline not to give up. That's awesome. No, that's great advice. And I, I mean, obviously th those 17 months weren't in vain. I mean, you were, you were refining the skills that ultimately led you to achieving great success over time. And it, but it took that mental fortitude as you had alluded to. And so, it, would you say that that's the best indicator of, of success in the industry? Yes. Yes, I, I will. And I'll get to that because I still don't know how to test for it. So mm -hmm. um, I always tell people like, I, I host trainings here every year. We have new training classes this year. We'll probably hire 200 agents. Most of them, almost all brand new to the business. Uh, most of them out of college um, that we, you know, we hire people to, who are new to the business, making a career change. And, and I always say like, you know, cause I want them to prepare for what's coming, which is it's going to be hard. You're probably not going to make as much money or as fast as you think, but don't worry. It could be worse. You could do what I do is a 17 months of not closing a deal. But I always tell them like, I didn't make money for 17 months, but I made millions my first 17 months. And people were like, huh, wait, what? Like, how does that pencil? It's like the seeds, the work. Yeah, exactly. The work I put in the cold calls I made, the first appointments I went on, the deals I pitched. And ultimately, you know, it's kind of like the spark of the fire that eventually grew very, you know, it'd be grew into a fire. Nobody can contain, but like it was all done in those first 17 months. I just didn't get the check in the first 17 months. Like there are deals. I remember there was a deal like eight years in, it was a big deal close, very, very sizable compensation associated with the deal. And, you know, I look and I'm like, man, where did this deal come from? I was like, okay, well, here's the seller. Where did the seller come from? It's like, well, you know, it came from this thing that traced back to this. And it was a referral from that, from a cold call I made in my fourth month in the business. And so I always tell people like, 
you may not get a check your first year or two in the business, but you're making millions. If you're showing up, working 14, 15 hour days, making cold calls, meeting with clients, presenting proposals, you are literally making millions of dollars. I just can't tell you when the money's going to show up and no one will convince me otherwise of that. Like I know this to be true. Um, so that's what I say about the first year in terms of not making money. I actually made a lot of money. I just didn't get the checks for many, many years. Um, in terms of identifying who's going to be good, who's not, who's going to make it, who's not intelligence health. I, I said, there's, there, there's only one determinant. There's lots of accelerators. There's only one determinant. The determinant is mental toughness and grit, right? Um, accelerators, yeah. intelligence, someone who's just naturally intelligent, who picks things up. That's an accelerator. Someone who has a high degree of emotional intelligence. Someone who just, you drop them in a room and within five minutes, they're going to be friends with everyone. That's an, that's an accelerator. It's an accelerator. Like yeah. I, you know, let, let me get back to intelligence. I've met brokers who do very well and I, you know, I'm not naming names who you meet them and you're like, you know, okay, like maybe they're not stupid, but they're not Elon Musk, right? They're not figuring out how to fly rockets to the moon and back. So, um, but they just keep showing up. They keep doing the job. They're fundamentally sound. They keep the client's interest at hearts. So they know their market. You know, maybe it took them longer to pick it up. That's okay. Um, but they just stuck to it. So I always say intelligence is not uh, a determinate. It's just an accelerator. Emotional intelligence. Again, the ability to mag magnanimous personality, that sales personality, most popular kid in school. Um, that's awesome. It's great to get people. It's great to have the skill to get people to like you quickly. I don't have that. That was never, I'm, I'm actually very naturally quiet. I'm very shy. I have borderline social anxiety disorder where I like, I sit there and if I walk into a room and people are new, I'm just like, Oh my God, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. Like, how do I get out of here? Which is interesting that I chose a sales sales gig, but um, you know, I, I managed my way through that. But um, again, it's great. If you have that personality, I know agents who were top agents who are very shy. They're very introverted. They just knew their product type. They knew how to sniff out a deal. They knew how to underwrite and they knew how to manage expectations. Like, so again, another thing, like the only real determinant is mental toughness, which really comes down to the ability to do something over and over and over again, when you're tired, when you're not being paid money to do it and to do it over and over again, knowing that you're likely going to fail over and over again. Anybody can fail for a short period of time. Anybody can work hard for a short period of time. Anybody can put effort into something for a short period of time, but only the mentally tough uh, human beings, those who have grit can do it day after day over a long period of time, not knowing when the sun will come up, but knowing that if they just never give up, it will happen to them. You know, it's, a, it's, it's hard. It's easy to come out of training in your third month and that first week rip 500 cold calls. You're excited. What about when you're 14 months in, you have one overpriced listing, your only escrow just died, you still haven't made money. And then Sunday night, you're going to bed saying, shit, I got, can I curse on this? Yeah, like, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah it's yeah. like, okay, crap. I have to wake up at 4.45 tomorrow and get in the office at 5.30, 5.45. So from six to nine, I can do my property research, my contact research, some underwriting, my meeting prep from nine to five. If I'm not meeting with an owner, making a hundred cold calls a day, then replying to emails throughout the day, but closing it out from five to seven, then from seven to eight 30 doing like, you know, my finish up work for the day. And I have nothing moving forward. My deals are dead. I feel like I'm failing and I have to keep doing this. Like that takes a very mentally tough person or crazy, um, or both, but, um, it's a, it's a very unique industry in that sense. I'm not saying, look, every job's tough. I, I've only lived my life. I, I can never know what people go through until I walk a mile in their shoes and I never will. So I could only tell you what my experience as a broker is like. Um, that's a very, very challenging mind game. I'd say the numbers play that out. Like, especially in the private client world where you're not coming through like a, an analyst position where you're an analyst for three to five years for a brokerage team where eventually over time you slowly assimilate into a production role. I look at that as a very, a very easy route to brokerage. I'm talking like old school, traditional, here's a phone, go make it happen. Straight commission. You have no book of business coming in. It's a, it's a tough road. And that's why, you know what? 90% of people fail. I'm not at Matthews, not at this company. We could talk about that later, but um, you know, the company I started at, we, I remember in training, there were 61, 62 people in the room and they beginning of training. They're like, yo, take a look around. 
the people running the training were like, in two years, only two of you will be left. Like 95% of people fail. And I remember like thinking, well, that ain't going to be me. I'm sure everybody thought that, but credit to them though. It's probably not a credit to their training. Two years from that day, literally like there were two people left me and another guy from a New York office who's still in the business and crushing it. And I was like, Oh my God, they're right. Like everyone was gone. And it's not because the training was bad. It's not because this, the tools and resources weren't there. It's because it, dude, it's hard. It's really, really hard. You can make a ton of money in commercial real estate brokerage. All the reasons I said I got into the business are real. They exist. They're actually bigger and better than I ever could have imagined. So, but why do most people quit? Cause it's so difficult. Absolutely. So it kind of brings me up to the next question here. It's kind of a two part is one is what made you decide going through all that training and all your years of experience to start your own shop. Um, and then what were some of the struggles as you grew your team or grew your company? Um, yeah, you know, I've, I've obviously a lot goes into the story, but I've, I've been asked this question a lot. So I've, I think I've got the elevator pitch down pretty well. So I'll, I'll keep, I'll okay. give you a condensed version. It, it was, um, I was at a, a publicly traded brokerage company at the time. I was coming off being their number one producer globally. This was 2014. So early 2015, um, the way my business worked, I was in investment sales, um, in retail. Uh, so sh think shopping centers and single tenant, net lease, Starbucks, Walgreens, those type. that was the type of product I focused in. We had, you know, the company had multifamily investment professionals, industrial hospitality, but I was retail. So what, what's, what's, I would say unique about retail amongst many things is the geographic, uh, despair, uh, the, the, the disparity, um, in terms of how assets are spread out. Right. Um, you know, you look at like, I, I'm, I'm here in Nashville, there might be 2000 apartment buildings in Nashville, right? Maybe more because multifamily buildings, you could have like, you know, 20 on the same block. Retail is much more spread out. And so you might only have three or 400. So generally you got to work multiple cities. Oftentimes you got to work multiple States. It just depends on where you're located. And in the net lease world, it's basically everywhere. You may have a broker is like, Oh, I, I, specialize in representing sellers and buyers of drugstores. So CVS, Walgreens, Rite Aid. Well, you might do transact over 10 states. And so I was at a company, this big company, they were going public and they were looking to kind of update their, um, their policies as it relates to doing deals outside of your core market. So they came to me and this is after, you know, a really great year. And they said, Hey, we, you know, I know you're in Southern California, but you're doing deals in Texas or Illinois or Florida or, you know, wherever. Well, moving forward, when you do those deals in those States, we're going to need you to pay the local agents, you know, 20, 30, 50%, whatever deal they, that the corporate, uh, whatever deal the corporate office had made with that local team, we need you to pay that is like kind of a exclusive market coverage rights or what we call a tax. And I was like, well, but why? Like they're not adding value. They're not helping me win the deal. If, if they add value, of course, I bring people in all the time. If I see the value, if there's no value, why would I do that? Um, and they're like, well, because we're going public, we got to clean this up. There's, you know, we have thousands of agents and yeah, you had, you know, you're number one guy, but still it's, there's more of them than you. And it just kind of got to this point where it just mathematically, it, it would have been detrimental to put it lightly to, to, my business, I had uh, six or seven mentees at the time, younger agents that had requested, had called me, uh, most of them like my younger brother's friends who had called and asked if I could take time out of my career to mentor them, which I agreed to. Um, and then, you know, they had their business that I worked with them on. Their business was also, you know, a wider region. So they would have been affected. And I just couldn't, I couldn't in good conscience agree to that structure. So um, unlike most exits. Mine was kind of, it was very amicable. It was very like talked through and understood. And while they were very sad to see me go, but they understood why um, I, I wasn't looking to leave, but it was just, they had a bigger opportunity in terms of taking the company public. It, it ended up going really well for them. They did great. Um, but it put me in this position where I, I had to leave and then evaluating some of the other brokerage companies nas nationally, I'll get a CB area, JLL, I, it was the same structure as like, look, if you do a deal in a different market, you have to pay that agent. And I just honestly, philosophically don't agree with that. I think that's a form of socialism. Um, you know, it's like, uh, Hey, if that was their market, how could someone like me ever come in and get the deal? Like they're, they're sleeping. They're not, they're, they should put walls around their market to where 
if I ever called an owner in that market, that owner would be like, Hey Kyle, I love you. Appreciate the call. If I have a deal where I was at the time, Southern California, Southern California, I'm going to hire you, but uh, this deal in Texas or this deal in Illinois, wherever I'm going with the local guy. Cause that's my guy. So I didn't just, not, not only were they, was I, the math didn't work out. I just philosophically don't agree with that concept. Um, clients dictate relationships. Okay. And so, um, but CB, JLL, the big companies, Cushman, they were set up just like that. And, and it, so it didn't solve my problem going to one of those. Then after that, it's just boutiques. And I was like, you know, basically running a boutique. I have seven or eight younger agents who are coming to me just to help them with their deals. Um, I was, I was, I had to personally like, get this. I, I don't know if this has changed. I don't think it has in most companies. Like I was doing more deals and I needed support. I needed marketing support. I needed transaction support. I needed underwriting support. And both of the companies I worked at before I started Matthews, they were like, if you want support, go get it, go pay for it, go train it. Like we don't have anything to do with that. Best case scenario is you could negotiate. They like give you a stipend. But I was like, I had to go basically create this company. I had to hire, I had to create job descriptions. I had to interview, I had to onboard, I had to train, I had to manage, I had to promote, I had to, you know, review. It just, it was, it was basically if my job is to generate business and win deals and it was just a big distraction. And so I was like, well, if I'm going to go to a boutique, I'm basically running a boutique. So ultimately to answer your question, it led me to this place like, well, I might as well just start my own company. It wasn't this lifelong goal. I, I would argue the opposite. I, I did not by nature want to take on that responsibility and that, that oversight and all that. Um, again, not a victim, but I kind of felt like, well, what were my other options? Right. Yeah. If I'm at a boutique, I'm basically running my own show anyway. And then if I'm at a big company, I got the same problem I did at the company I was leaving, which is, um, taxation without representation. So, uh, yeah. um, I, I just, you know, went in and I said, Hey, look, I, here's what I think I'm going to do. I think I'm going to start my own thing. And they're like, okay, we understand. And that was it. And we just picked a date, uh, a month or two out that would work best for everybody. And, and that was, um, April, 2015. So, you know, we're coming up on eight years now. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and, and nice. obviously the, the, the necessity for doing so as a result of all the, the, the things that transpired. And, you know, I'm kind of curious about your evolution up until this point, because you guys have been able to grow pretty significantly over the last eight years. Um, it's been pretty impressive to see. So as far as the, the growth piece is concerned, you know, how have you been able to scale at this level as quickly as you have, if you could kind of speak to that, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Look, we go hard, man. Um, thank you. So I think it's, I'll start it by saying we're self-funded, mm -hmm. you know, it's my money, right? Um, we have no debt, no investors. So uh, I think that always catches people by surprise because, because the growth, which to my knowledge has not been seen in commercial real estate, um, it's happened organically. So we have almost effectively no M and A, um, very little recruiting. So almost everyone at Matthews, I would say over 95% of the agents at Matthews, their first job in brokerage is at Matthews. So they're homegrown, trained, you know, we call it build through the draft, right? Uh, I had a, I, one of my brothers had played for the Packers for a while. And, um, when he got drafted by that franchise, like it was, it was interesting learning. Cause I had, you know, I didn't know much about the Green Bay Packers. Like they're the way they built that franchise the way they run it for years was built through the draft while you have other teams like i don't know you know i'm thinking of uh the, the tampa bay buccaneers a couple of years ago they won the super bowl they was all free agency it was bringing tom brady bringing gronk and so we were always like okay we're a build through the draft company and so somehow and you know i'll walk you through in my opinion how but uh in seven seven and a half years we we went from one office to i think we have 18 we went from you know 10 agents to 500 um, you know, seven employees to 120, 130 employees. Um, and just, we did it. I mean, we just, we just go so hard. Like, you know, the, the, the culture of a company is a shadow of the CEO, right? So it's hard to hide out at a company and not go full speed and not want to be the absolute best, the greatest of all time at what you do. I don't care if you're a marketing production person, the junior cold caller or the CEO, like I want to be the greatest that has ever done this. And like every morning I wake up and I said, that is what I'm here to do is that when the day comes, I hang up my cleats for whatever it's worth in the real estate industry, people either look, talk, or point at me and say, that's the greatest who's ever done it. And, um, and so that becomes like the ethos of the company. 
And not that everybody does it and um, not, you know, and I'm not saying it's perfect, but our agents, they, it's when I say, okay, you need to get in at 6am. Like you're asking me, what do I, hey Kyle, what does it take to be successful? Right. That that's ultimately what they're asking. They really want to be successful. Kyle, you were successful in brokerage. What do I need to do? I was like, well, let me tell you what I did and let's start there. So I got in at six. I stayed till 8 30. I made 500 cold calls. I went on four meetings to five meetings a week. I presented generally speaking, two proposals a week. And oh, by the way, like I had no support. I didn't know anything about real estate. I had to do everything myself. So like at Matthews where they have a lot more, I don't think it's going to take you 17 months to close the deal. I think you're going to be a lot more successful. And that's what we see. And so, um, you know, I think the average age of our agents is like 25, 26 years old, you know, and yet we have, I, I, I'd be hard pressed to find another company anywhere, a company much bigger than us, who've put the amount of talent in the industry that we have over the last seven years. In fact, I, I bet my money, there's no one close. Um, and we're not the biggest company. It's just, this is our program. We bring in, we hire skill sets, not mindsets. I mean, we, we hire mindsets, not skill sets. We, we hire mentality because I can teach you a skill set. I could teach you how to underwrite. I could teach you how to communicate your value of rev. I could teach you how to talk to an owner about features and benefits. I could teach you, um, you know, how to uh, how to draft a listing agreement. I can't teach you how to be an absolute killer. I can't teach you how to be a dog. And just you know, I always say there's two there's two types of people. There's the everybody wants to be successful, but few need to be successful. I can't teach you how to need to be successful. I always say. It's a need to be successful is like Maslow's hierarchy needs is a basic need. Okay. The basic needs are understood to be air, water, food, and shelter. If you don't have one of those four, you're going to die. It's like air. If you don't have air, you die in three minutes, water, you die in three days, food, you die in three weeks and shelter. You just eventually succumb. I said, Matthews, there's a fifth basic need. It's success. And if you're a real Matthews guy or gal, if you aren't successful, eventually you won't You'll, you'll die internally, you know, I'm not saying literally and maybe, but, um, and, and we're, we, we work so hard and we search so hard and work to find those mentalities, those young men and women. And again, it isn't an age thing. We, we do obviously hire a lot from college, but like young to the business um, and just search for those mentalities, turn over every stone. We go to a, what, 176 career fairs a year, whatever it takes for us to find that mentality, those rare, just savages that will stop at nothing and not only be willing to listen to your coaching, but apply it and just do it over and over again and never give up. And, and my long answer to your short question is like, that's how we've done it. There's no, we don't have P backing and angel investor. We haven't done this through buying a bunch of, you know, small companies and rolling it up. It is literally a homegrown incubated um, operation. And that, you know, ultimately gets to why this culture is so tight, so tight. It's amazing. No. And, and, and that's what people, yeah, that, of course it did. No, that, that's exactly what I was asking is, is the, the, the way that you're able to do that is through cultivating people who already have that dogged determination and putting them all in a room and then focusing on one thing. That's awesome. And then, and like, eventually I, I try and explain this. I don't have the right words. Is like the culture kind of become it, it becomes the self-police in the sense, like, Early on, you know, when I hired those first agents, you know, I'd be at the office at 545, they'd come in, I'd be like, come on, like, we got to go, we got to go. Yeah. But then eventually it just becomes, it becomes its thing. And, and um, I don't want to be too sports focused. Like I talk about USC, so I'll use like a, like, but I'm going to say sports focus, just a more relevant example. I use like Alabama football. I don't, I don't watch a lot of football, believe it or not. And um, I couldn't tell you that much about Alabama football other than that. The program Nick Saban seems to have created is the culture kind of takes care of itself. Like, you know, that if you choose to go to Alabama, you're signing up for something different. You're signing up to work harder than any other program that with the expectations higher than any other program, any other program you go, you know, 11 and two, you're like, Oh, we had a great year. We made like a top bowl game. We got this ring 11 and two year Alabama. They're talking about like, this is, this is a tragedy. Like this is not, Alabama standards. Like we need to figure this out. Like we're not like everyone else. We're different. And that's what you sign up. And if this is too hard, hit the transfer portal, go find a nice little program where you're going to, you're going to have easy playing time. You're going to go eight and five and play in the holiday bowl. Okay. That's not what Alabama is. You come here because you want to be the absolute best you can ever be iron sharpens iron, right? So every day 
in practice. You're going to go against the best yeah. players in practice. So come Saturday, the game's easy. It's that same concept, that same energy that to the best of my abilities, we look to create here at Matthews, right? And so, you know, maybe the the weakest guy or gal in a Matthews office might be the hardest worker at another company. That's probably true, candidly. Um, but that doesn't matter to us. All that matters are the people inside these walls and pushing them to be the absolute best version of themselves. That's great. Um, I was just kind of curious of how your growth has been going. How do you see the future of your company? Um, is there a set goal or are you just going to just let it keep going and keep watering the, let me, let me look into my crystal ball for a second. <laughs> nice. Um, you know, look, we're going to keep, we're going to keep going. We're going to keep, yeah. the music's going to keep playing. We're going to keep dancing. Um, I mean, the market right now is, is, it sucks. It's, uh, it's very challenging. Um, there's massive gaps between what sellers want and what buyers, uh, you know, can pay, let's say willing to pay. It's cool. effectively driven by debt. You know, I understand Jerome Powell. I'm not in his shoes. I, I recognize what he's looking to achieve and why it's important. So I'm not passing judgment. Um, it's easy for me to sit here in armchair, you know, Monday morning quarterback. Oh, they should have raised rates earlier. Well, if they did, we wouldn't have had the 2021 in early 22. We guys, real estate owners, investors, brokers, we were making so much money in 21 and 22. And I guarantee you, most of us thought it was because we were that good. We're not that good. And just like right now where it's really difficult, we're not that bad. Like, you know, so you can't have all the upside, none of the downside. So, the, you know, the feds on this rate hike, um, committed to rate hikes to, to what is it? Uh, is, uh reestablishing, uh, price stability, I think was, was his word. So I get it. It is what it is. Um, but it's created this massive gap and it's up to agents to bridge that gap. It's up to agents to, when they talk to sellers from the moment they speak to them and the moment they meet with them to manage those expectations, bring the price expectations down, not because they should be less but because they, it's just where the market, they, we, an owner goes, Oh, well, six months ago, this deal trade is like, and six months ago, rates were here. Like the markets change. And the same time, you know, walking a buyer through, like there is still value add on this deal. There is still upside on this deal. Like the fundamentals, most of the operating fundamentals of real estate are still very good right now. I know there's some markets in multifamily are starting to see some rent softening, some vacancy increases. But, you know, I know in some niche products, like whether self storage, you know, or uh, I mean, industrials rock and retail is doing great. Like, I mean, look at the jobs report. That's the problem. That's why PAL is a continue, you know, it's people are still. Uh, getting hired and spending money. So the operating fundamentals are there and it's up to us as agents to bridge that gap. It's just sometimes that gap is too big and that's why you see less deals. And it's, uh, I know it's really tough for capital markets uh, agents around the country. I could tell you um, all things being considered, we're doing really well, um, but it's still much more difficult today than 18 months ago. Your question is what does the future hold? Or right now, we are full. I mean, right now we will continue to be full speed ahead. We're going to hire another 200 agents new, new to the industry this year. Um, we're going to train them up. We're going to provide them a best in class support platform, uh, database, production, technology, digital marketing, financial analysis. Um, but they got to pick up the phone. They got to make the calls. They got to set the meetings and they have to ask good questions, listen, and then figure out a way to add value to real estate owners holdings. That's what we do. We're service providers. So assuming we can continue to do that like we have, we're going to keep growing. We're going to keep adding offices. I will say in the last year, I don't, I don't know what happened. I would, maybe it's, we just got big. Um, uh, I can't, we're not, we're, this isn't like a campaign we're on, but the, um, the amount of agents, established agents in the industry that are now reaching out to us um, has been uh, insane, you know, in terms like we're doing our best to keep up with the inbound calls of like, Hey, you know, I see what you're doing. I, I saw you're opening an office in my market. You know, it's not that I'm making, I'm looking to make a move, but you know, I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. So I'd say for the first time ever in our history, um, we're, we're having a lot of the senior agent conversations. So it's a combination of our foundational growth strategy of hiring new training them up, getting really good mentor mentee relationships going but probably for the first time, having some some senior agents who see uh, the support, the culture, and the opportunity within Matthews, and and that seems to be accelerating our growth. So we're full speed ahead. You know, it's uh, be greedy when others are fearful. If, if no one's ever said that, I'll I'll coin that term, right? But uh, but yeah, it's um, it's more of the same from us, candidly. 
That's amazing. Yeah, no, and mm-hmm. and 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 doubling down when times are tough or is the is the method to them is yeah. is a method that will serve you, you guys well. You long gotta term. you gotta have the cash to do it, right? Yeah. And then you got you, let me let me. If you're a smaller company or privately held, you got to have the cash to do it. And most smaller companies don't have that discipline. Like in 2021 and 22, they make tons of money. What do they do? Most owners sweep the cash. They sweep the cash. They leave They leave enough to cover their payroll for the next six months, but they sweep all the cash because they think they're that good because they think it's going to last forever. And then they go buy buildings. They, they fund their kids' colleges. They buy a boat, whatever. You know, They invest the money. And then the market turns quick and they're like, oh crap, like this isn't good, right? And that's what most boutiques do. And that's why you see, there's already three companies that I've seen effectively implode in the last six months, real small brokerage companies that I'm aware of that just, they can't even pay their agents anymore. And it's like, how does that happen? It's like they sweep the cash. Then you look at the public companies in my space, they have all the cash in the world, but they're public. They're quarter by quarter, they have boards. And I don't know if you saw this, their fourth quarter, um, 2022 annual and their fourth quarter reports were brutal, brutal. It was really bad for them. And, um, and so if they get on an earnings call and they don't have a clear, not only answer, but a proactive in their, in their opening speech as to how with their revenue down 50% in capital markets, how, what are they doing to conserve? What, what are they doing to, um, lower costs or like, Oh, every single one of these companies have announced layoffs. They had one bad quarter and they lay, oh, we're, we're saving. We have, we removed four, 400 million of headcount or whatever, 40 million of headcount. Like it's because they're living quarter to quarter. So, you know, my opinion is most companies can't, even if they want to, and they say, yes, like in tough markets, that's when we should grow because when the market snaps back, we're going to explode out of this. They can't public companies struggle because they have a, they have a different set of bosses. Right. And it's the public markets. And the smaller companies can't because it's hard when you own a company and you know you have some boutique brokerage and you make you know your company makes five million bucks, ten million bucks, and it's sitting there and it's you know if they're a founder, it's most of their money or it's all their money, and they say, "Well, no, I'm going to leave it there for a rainy day." It's a very difficult thing that I've found for other people, for most people to do. They really seem to struggle with it. They'd rather take the money and go invest it, or God knows what they do with it, but it's gone. And then when times get tough, like right today, and you're in, and to your point, you, they should be growing, they should be hiring, they should be recruiting. They're not, they can't because they don't have the capital and they become capital constrained. And God forbid this challenging market gets deep enough in a bad way or lasts long enough in a bad way. A lot of them don't make it. Yeah. yeah. Well, some great insights for sure. So one of the things we typically like to ask, so first off, Kyle, we greatly appreciate your time. I know you're a very busy right. individual. And so, uh, one of the things we like to ask near the end of our podcast episode is we like to ask our guests to, to uh, contribute as far as uh, what what the the term commercial real estate treasure chest. It's a repository of resources that we make available to our audience. Um, you know, they, a lot of our guests have contributed helpful PDFs, spreadsheets, really anything they feel would be of value to the audience. I don't know if you have something that you'd be willing to contribute. I I, I do. I I was just you know. Um was thinking about your question and we've talked a lot about that first year and how difficult it was and what separates or what do we train? How come here have we, we've been successful and it really get, comes down to that grind, that work ethic. So I actually have, I have, I think I labeled it as so cheesy, the million dollar agent schedule. You know, I'm like a 22 year old, like I want to be a million dollar agent. Um, but uh, I have my schedule is very, for, very, very straightforward, very disciplined from my first couple of years. And like, I broke it down to like 15 minute increments. And um, from the time I wake up to what I do right before I go to bed and everything in between, um, obviously if you're in brokerage, you can use it, right? Just, okay, here are the hours I cold call, here are the hours I set meetings. But even if you're not, you can, um, you know, use it to kind of establish a frame of, of reference of like just the amount of time you should be dedicating to your career, but also just how you should structure your day. Even if what you're doing is different from an activity sense to what I might have been doing as a commercial real estate broker my first year. But I, I think it would be helpful because I can tell you my first year in the business, I didn't really have anyone who said, Hey, here's exactly what you should do. Here's what your day should let here. Are the hours you work. It was just like, you know, that's where you sit. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. Right. Yeah. So, no, pro- no. Providing that would be helpful for sure. Yeah. Having a frame of reference and understanding of what you do on a day to day and follow that level of success would be helpful. So we appreciate that contribution and we'll include that in the repository as well. It's all good. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. We really do appreciate your time and you coming on, sharing your story. Um, 
I know some people uh, are going to be able to benefit. Uh, I don't know if they can relate to have an NFL uh, father, but uh, mm -hmm. at least they, they can uh, relate to, you know, the hard start of getting into brokerage. He's just, so he's, just a, he's a really good dad. Um, he's just a dad. He, he's just a guy who happened to play football. So he's a very yeah. normal guy. If you saw him, um, you know, you wouldn't even know. He doesn't talk about it. And, and as a family, we really, it's just, it's, again, what allowed us to pivot is just, it was just, it was just what we did for a minute. You know, obviously brothers, dad, uncle, cousins, they did a lot longer than I did. It's just something I did. It's not, it's not who I am. Yeah. Um, but also I know that some people are going to want to get in touch with you. Uh, you are, you got a lot going on, but, uh, how would they get in touch with you email or. Yeah. So I mean, a couple of ways, I mean, the easiest historically is just email me. Like, I think people are surprised at how responsive I am. It's the, uh, it's the broker heart in me. I was a broker for so long that when you have uh, when you have clients, whether you're on vacation, whether it's 11 o'clock at night or 4:30 in the morning, like when that client reaches out, it is your responsibility to get to get back to them. And so, even though people reach out, they're not necessarily a client. Like I still have that uh, mindset and mentality. Uh, so you could just email. I also recently have. Um, my social media guys like, yo, you know, plug the social. So I have social media now. Um, in the last six months they started an Instagram. Um, what is it? Kyle Matthews, CEO. Oh, there you go. Uh, I have a Twitter, which is, I think, same name. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. I've been on LinkedIn for years. Not, you know, historically wasn't crazy active, but like, again, these guys are pushing me to push out content. You know, they, they're like, Hey, a lot of people would love to hear from you about, you know, whatever it is. So, I'm, I am, uh, I am making the effort. I know they wish I did more, but you know, between the, the company, the four kids and everything in between, there's only so much time. So email, but, um, you could, you could send, send me a message, uh, through Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever I, I within 24 hours, I'll probably see it. And then I'll do my best to respond as quickly as possible. That's amazing. No, really. And so we'll include that. We'll include that in the show notes. So if you guys are watching this on YouTube, feel free to go ahead in the description and access that. Also, if you guys are listening to this in a podcast format, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, it'll be in the description as well. So again, Kyle, thank you so much for your time. We greatly appreciate uh, you taking some time out of your busy schedule to be able to sit with us today. If you guys are watching this on YouTube, we would greatly appreciate it if you could like and subscribe. It makes a huge impact in our ability to reach a broader audience. Along with that, if you guys are watching or listening to this in a podcast format, whether it's Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please, please leave a five-star review. We've seen a significant uptick in our downloads as a result of you guys doing so. So we would greatly appreciate the support. Thanks again so much for tuning in, and we'll see you all next time. Thanks, guys.